interacting with interacting with us informally if you're okay with that we'd be ready to start your formal presentation so uh, i will introduce you and uh, i'm sorry with my german you guys can oh, laugh at me <laughs> there's lots of complicated words there uh, so Ahmed Rosa is a soci sociologist and philosopher. He's a professor at the Friedrich Schiller University in Jena, Germany, and director of the Max Weber Center for Advanced Cultural and Social Studies at Erfurt University and chair of sociology and social theory at Friedrich Schiller University, Germany. He has been a visiting professor at the New School for Social Research in New York for 2001-2006 and at the Fondation Maison des Sciences de l'Homme, École des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales in Paris. In addition, he holds an honorary doctorate from the University of Humanistic Studies, Utrecht. He's a co-director of the annual International Philosophy and the Social Science Conference in Prague, and for many years served as Vice President, Secretary General for the Research Committee 35 of the International Sociological Association. From 2008 to 2018, he co-edited the international journal Time and Society. He received numerous awards, among them the Tractatus Award and the Oh boy. <laughs> Paul, what? thank you, <laughs> Austria, and the Erich from Press Germany of the annual Rob Rhodes Global um, Citizenship Education Award 2020 UCLA. His papers and books have been translated into more than 20 languages. Among his most important books are Alienation and Acceleration 2007, Social Acceleration, A New Theory of Modernity, Columbia Press 2013, Resonance, A Sociology of a Relationship to the World, Polis Polity Press 2019, and The Uncontrollability of the World, Polity Press 2020. In 2013, Professor Rosa was included by the Nouvel Observateur in the list of the 25 most important thinker worldwide. In the current list 2019 of Germany, 500 most important intellectual published by Sierco magazine, he is ranked in the top 50 and among of the three most important social sciences and humanities scholar. So please join me in welcoming this amazing person. <laughs> it's just the pink. floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction. And also uh, thanks a lot for inviting me to, to your uh, really exciting conference. Actually, when you asked, uh, I, I was determined to come, right? <laughs> because I had really, uh, I have fond memories of, uh, and, and not just, uh, actually, I even like, I liked the city. I was there in winter. It was incredibly cold, <laughs> but very nice. But I was also impressed by the spirit of discussion and by the sense of really uh, having also kind of connecting uh, the academic life with the uh, with social life, and uh, of and of course uh, the the conference program looks really great, right, with Nancy Fraser and um, and all the others that that are on that program. But of course also because of the topic. But then I couldn't make it because of obligations I have uh, here and also in France. But I'm happy that so so Corona was bad enough. But having the chance to at least talk to people via Zoom has some advantages. I mean, we all know that digital conversation is not the same as um, as uh, as uh, real life encounters. I mean, I could actually talk for hours about why it's very difficult to get in resonance uh, digitally. Right, that the pro one huge problem is is that we can see each other, but we cannot look each other into the eyes. Right? We don't see each other's faces. And face-to-face -face contact is a prime form of resonance, right? I mean, it's it's through the eyes and it's through uh, the faces, the tiny, but it's also, I, I could go on for hours, but I don't want to do this, right? The physical interaction is even the way we hear each other, right? But also the sense that we share a space creates a kind of it's a kind of priming for resonance, right? I mean, you who are there right now in Ottawa, you know that other people have the same feeling of the temperature, the same smell in the air, the same sounds. And this physical co-presence already creates something like a kind of physical resonance, which you do not get if you do, you know, if, 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 if we do what I do right now, I also have a certain space around me with certain smells and colors and heat and so on or temperatures. 
but I have to block them out because they are not relevant for you. So I would really say there we can really see how kind of forms of alienation or nude relationships enter the, the human realm and are part of the problem of this society. So, but now I've said enough about, I've lamented enough. I would actually like to share my screen with you because I've, well, I'm not so sure whether it's always a good idea. Maybe I'm, actually, I'm, I don't know. Yeah, I've prepared some PowerPoints, so let's let's use them. Um, you can can you see you can see my screen now, right? Yeah. Okay. So I wanted to uh, present something to you. I'm not sure. You know, I'm I mean I'm not sure whether it's a good idea, <coughs> but uh, I think one has to um, be to to be courageous in uh, in uh, events like this. So I want to present a conception of what I call a listening society. Of course, this society should not just be listening. It should also be answering and interacting. But I really think, you know, I think there is a problem in our world that we always insist on everyone wants to have a voice. And I think that's completely right. That's the great promise of democracy that everyone should be given a voice. But in order for democracy to work, it also requires that everyone has ears. And I think actually, even in theory, we forget about the ear part, right? We always want to give people voice to struggle. All my colleagues talk all the time, particularly those on the left, of course, where I consider myself to, myself to be. They always talk about social struggle, right? And fighting for our interests and so on. And, and, but I think actually democracy only works if we also have ears, are receptive to other beliefs, other forms of living, loving, and so on. So, so that's a bit what I want to focus on. And with this, I come up with a new, what I call a new conception of the common good. And I have no idea whether this is convincing or at least uh, inspiring or not. So you will tell me in the end, right? And uh, okay. So I want to uh, move in these uh, four steps. First, I kind of, uh, uh, I sum up what I've said quite a few times, uh, what, where the problem is, right? You have uh, in your conference title, right? It's about the multiple crisis of society in, 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 in the many phase crisis, so to speak. I have a kind of, I will give you a summary of my take on this, but then I will really turn to politics. It's I, I, actually, I don't think that politics is my, my strongest point, right? But I think it is important, of course, it's important for what you try to do and it's important for our society. And I want to, in the, our small informal discussion, I've hinted at it, I really want to come up with a, or suggest that we should reconceive, uh, reconceptualize politics and democracy. And of course, we should do this with the conception of resonance, which I will present in the third step, and then point out, sketch out what I think a listening society and, um, and connected to this a new approach to the common good could look like. So what is the problem of our society? Um, and I think, if, you know, we, we talked about it in 2019 already, but uh, not all of you, of course, were there, right? In my definition, the, the heart of a modern society, I mean, after all, I'm a sociologist, and sociologists kind of try to give structural in interpretations of institutional realities, right? And my take, my claim is that we should insist on a on, 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 on the sense of totality of society, right? There are not just many societies. I don't, I even think there are not just multiple modernities because there is something, the different modernities uh, in the different spheres of the world and even in the different epochs from the 18th century onward, there are some features these societies have in common. And, and this is the main feature. <coughs> I call it dynamic stabilization. And you see my definition. A society can be called modern, when its mode of stabilization is dynamic. And this means that it systematically requires material growth, technological acceleration and cultural innovation in order to reproduce its structure and to maintain the institutional status quo. This is in Canada as it is in Europe or in, uh, in, the, in, in the USA or actually in China, right? Even, I mean, you look Liz Truss, <laughs> Liz Truss who is now uh, gone, right? Uh, she said uh, we want to, she wants to achieve growth, growth, growth. But actually, the German government, which even contains the Green Party, which is a very strong player, they say the same. They say we need to grow out of the crisis. <coughs> Why do we need growth? I mean, think of what it means for Germany to grow, right? I mean, so we have some sectors of our industry we need, which need to grow. Actually, all of them need to grow. So the strongest sector is the automobile industry. So ask green politicians, do you want to have more cars and trucks? And they would say, you are nuts. Of course, they don't want that. So the other, the fastest growing industry before Corona 
was the air traffic, airplanes. So ask our green politicians, do you want to have more airplanes? And they would say, oh, no, 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 that's not a good idea. Okay, so no trucks, no, but even the, the car industry, the truck industry and the airplane industries, they all need to grow actually. But then the next a big thing would be a construction. So should we build more houses? That's a very bad idea in terms of, en of energy consumption, in terms of resource consumption, but also in terms of using up um, a green, a green um, you know, the, the, the area, <coughs> the spaces. So no, so we shouldn't grow there either. So should we grow in more smartphones and more computers? That's that's digitalization is the big thing. More servers, more smartphones, more computers every year. That's a mad idea also, right? I mean, because of the pollution we create, because of the energy we consume, and uh, and uh, and so on. So finally, we could grow in food, and, and the problem is growing in food is would be a good idea because we have eight hundred million people in the world who are hungry. But they cannot buy this food. So our food companies, our food industries need to grow and to sell it to the people who are already too heavy, right? We are obese, right? And how do you do? How do you sell it to us? Well, actually, they manipulate the connection. <coughs> I don't know. I, I have I have a cough, which is not Corona. I hope, right? Um, so they they uh, they interrupt the connection between the stomach and the brain. Uh, so even when we are full, we keep eating. So that's one. That, those are the ways to ensure growth. And without these forms of growth, I mean, they are mad. Uh, we cannot maintain our number of jobs, the companies, but also the the healthcare system, the uh, the pensions teams, and the um, cultural sectors, and so on. So this is what I mean, right? A modern society is structurally forced to grow, accelerate, and innovate just to maintain the institutional status quo. And as I've said, that's not a good idea, right? It basically means, and you know, I think what has changed, why, we, why now the sense of crisis is so strong, is the fact that uh, now we no longer feel that we are moving forward by growing and accelerating and innovating, but we have to do it <coughs> even in the full knowledge that this will make our life actually it will destroy the planet right i mean this is the this is the double squeeze the ecological economic double squeeze on the one hand we have to run faster accelerate and innovate even though this is mad and on the other hand we are kind of killing our ecological uh, our planet at, uh, with this <coughs> i don't know what this is so the so the consequence of this Uh, is uh, what I call a mode of aggression that uh, our dominant form of, you know, I'm concerned with our relationship to the world, our human relationship to the world, in, uh, individual and institutional. And my idea is that we are kind of living on a mode of aggression towards world. It's aggression towards nature. When we extract everything from Mother Earth, so to speak, when we pollute it. But it's also aggression in the social realm. And you see it in the way we conduct politics. I find this very important. I mean, uh, Michael Bruta from London School of Economics has done an in, in, most interesting study in 27 democracies all over the world, where he says uh, what is changing is political culture, but right? people perceive of each other as enemies, <coughs> not as kind of people of a different political opinion, but as mortal enemies, like in the United States, where the liberals are ready to kill the Republicans basically and the other way around. I mean, you know, it's not just that Trump. You know, it's you could see it with Trump versus Hillary Clinton. Of course, you can see it. It has not gotten any better. Uh, but Trump, uh, Trump supporters shouted, lock her up. They wanted to get rid of Clinton. Silence her. Don't even talk to her. But Clinton, Hillary Clinton kind of uh, took revenge by claiming that the Republicans are a bucket of deplorables. But you see, this is kind of the political interaction. It's aggression. We hate each other. And of course, war is the most, now war is coming back. I think it's a consequence of a mode of aggression lived towards the world. And uh, the situation in the US, you could see in Britain, where the Brexiteers and the Remainers uh, encountered each other in a mode of aggression. And you could see it in Germany, when those in favor of vaccination against COVID uh, and those against vaccination considered each other no longer, you know, no longer as kind of equals in a political debate. But mutually, they conceived of each other as, as kind of people you can't speak to because they are irrational, idiotic, fascist, and anti-Semitic, whatever, on the one hand. 
are traitors and tra and, uh, and, um, and 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 criminals on the other hand. And, and, and as I said, now war is the worst form of political aggression. Uh, but actually, aggression is even rising in the relationship towards ourselves. This I find really interesting, right? I mean, we, we like to think of ourselves as hedonistic, always looking for fun. But when you look at empirical data, you get quite a different picture, particularly young people. I mean, the mental health of young people all over the world, actually all over the world, but particularly over the Western world, but also in Asia, it's almost worse in China, South Korea, or Japan, right? But it's the same in the Canada, and actually I don't have data of Canada, but of the United States or Europe, young people are kind of in a very disastrous state. And why? Because they are in a kind of aggression towards themselves. They have the feeling they don't look nice enough, they are too heavy, or they are not fast enough, and then they don't have enough friends, and they don't, and, and you know, we even are aggressive against our own psyche. I cannot sleep good enough. I, I don't get um, 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 active fast enough. I'm not mindful enough. I'm not sportive enough. I'm not creative enough. The, the data really suggests that, you know, people don't feel at home with themselves. They don't feel okay in their skins. They're permanently, I call it parametric optimization. We, we have the idea that there are so many parameters of life, the number of friends you have, the number of uh, credit points you got, the, the, the ranking of, uh, of your achievements, but also the number of friends, the likes, the followers, and so on. And then also the number of steps you take and the number, the hours you sleep and so on. The, I call it parametric optimization. And this leads to a mode of aggression in the macrosphere of nature, in the mesosphere of political interaction, and in the microsphere of our dealing with ourselves, right? <clears throat> So I find it quite interesting in terms of energy, right? I mean, we are kind of, we, 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 it's quite interesting how we deal with energy. We permanently have to use, to extract more energy from nature, from ourselves and from the political realm. And this leads to a burning up, to heating up of the atmosphere, to burning out of the, um, of the individuals and to a kind of the, the will to burn each other up, to blow each other up even in wars now, right? So it's, there's, alienation on all three levels of potential interaction, right? Our mode of being in the world, of relating to the world is a mode of aggression in the social sphere, in the natural sphere, and in the, in the, in the, in the, in the subjective sphere, or the psychological sphere of relating to ourselves. And I think this actually might be one of the reasons why we perceive of politics as the realm of struggle and conflict. I really think <clears throat> from, I mean, I, I actually, I mean, you know, when you think of people who, who are very, I mean, they have a lot, they are very bright and they have a lot in favor of what they are saying, but nevertheless, people like Ranciere or Badiou or actually also Laclau and Mouffe and so on, they, I, I read them as saying that politics is essentially conflict and struggle, right? So what is politics? Well, politics is a sphere of irreconcilable conflict of struggle, right? and of overcoming um, or of kind of forming, trying to form a strategic hegemony, right? So, <clears throat> so my counterclaim is that the idea that politics is essentially social antagonism, right? Groups which fight each other is not a kind of anthropological given. It's a truth about our society of, of aggression. But if we share this conception of politics, claiming that politics is aggression, is conflict, we will not overcome the problem. I know this is, a, I wonder whether you share this idea, probably you don't, <laughs> at least a lot of people don't. But I think I will, sh I will show you my, my, basically what I want to say is that the way that the, so to speak, um, <clears throat> um, social ontology, right? What, what the nature, of the, of the relationship of different social groups and individuals is, is itself, it's, it's not given, it's not anthropologically defined, it's a, it's a consequence of the political process itself, right? Now, but the problem is that the idea that politics is essentially conflict is advocated by the political right and by the political left. Right? Of course, people like Carl Schmitt uh, would follow this, right? Politics is defined by the friend foe or friend enemy distinction, right? So that's politics is about this, right? But when you come from a Marxist perspective or Ranciere or Laclau Mouffe, then you get the same sense. It's irreconcilable conflict, right? 
So, uh, so, uh, or so you can be Darwinist or Marxist to end up with the same idea. Social ontology is so the, the social ontology is um, uh, social antagonism, right? And uh, actually, when, so attempts at pacification are always met with suspicion, right? I mean, you, you, you I, I had, I mean, I had some uh, quotes by German uh, by German authors, which I know uh, did, which which I did not use today. But the idea of Mar Oliver Marquardt, for example, he would really say that all pacification, the idea to somehow create a peaceful form of living together, right, is just a transitory, Ill illusionary state of hegemonic uh, domination, okay? <clears throat> so if you have this kind of image, then political action essentially is social struggle, and it's a struggle for power and domination. And my claim is that this conception of politics is exactly what is driving the modern capitalist form of uh, dynamic stabilization, right? Uh, it's itself, it's a consequence of the mode of aggression. So if you want to overcome the mode of aggression, we need an other, a different conception of politics. <clears throat> okay, so I, I've, I've said this, I think I can, I can leave it at this point and let's move to the next point, right? Now I, I would really, I, so, so as I've already said, uh, uh, in my view, the, uh, we need a relational social ontology to take that idea serious means that the form and the nature of citizens, or let's say, let's call them citizens, the form and the nature of citizens' mutual relations are not pre-given or predetermined. It's wrong to say they have to be antagonistic. They are not antagonistic by nature. Whether they are antagonistic or not depends on the social institutions, right? As the, the ties are formed in the political process itself, right? So now I really wonder, you know, I, what could be a different conception of politics? And I must say, for me, it was always clear that the prime, the, the cardinal, the, the core definition of politics is not struggle. The, for me, politics means shaping our shared world right our common world of course we live we all and always live in societies or in shared forms of life and no individual can define and or, or create forms of life so it's a shared process basically but nevertheless human beings shape human be it doesn't have to be democratic right politics means intentionally shaping the the structures of the shared life world the institutions and the structures of the shared life world. That's politics. And of course, um, uh, politics can be done individually by a dictator. It's still politics. The dictator is shaping the structures and the institutions with the help of others then, of course, right? So, and out of this shaping, the prevailing patterns of relation are uh, created. And now what is democracy then? Democracy for me is at, at its core, at its heart, the idea that the shaping of the political world should be done collectively with everyone having a voice or the same voice uh, in this process, right? So at democracy's heart, there's the promise of a political voice through which the body politic can be appropriated. So the idea is uh, the, the, we live in a shared life world inevitably, right? And this shared life world is politically shaped and not completely, but to a large extent. And democracy is the promise that this Shaping is, is done by all of us, right? There is a kind of equalities. What, what, what makes citizens citizens is that they have an equal um, um, a possibility to, to partake in this shaping. Right? So if, we if you define politics this way, it's not necessarily and always and in nature antagonistic. <clears throat> okay, so... Uh, so in my my uh, my uh, in in my take, right, uh, democratic politics is constituted by the idea that the body politics is shaped collectively, give everyone an equal voice. I already said that, but I have to insist again, and also equal ears. It, it's not sufficient to have a voice, right? You have to be receptive. That's the core of resonance. I will come back to this in a second. I, I don't know. I should. I know. I should not go forever, right? Uh, but but it's so it's so this leads of course to resonance and resonance requires that my voice is heard and inserted but i have to have ears through which i hear the others which then transforms our uh, in, in, which then transforms the people all of them right so that's of course a republican conception of uh, politics right and i think this is what creates the bond of solidarity the knowledge that the others have voices and ears too that I want to listen to them and they want to listen to me. And by, by doing this, we kind of, we, we permanently transform ourselves and the others. And I have to say that even, 
I must I find this frightening that even on the left, there are a lot of people. I recently talked to a gen, um, uh, gender activist, and I I, 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 I said to her, yeah, I, I totally share your ideas, but I but I feel that we can somehow have to move a bit uh, somehow carefully or even slowly because otherwise the majority of people will go against us. And then she she said, I don't care about the majority of people. I don't want to live outside my bubble, right? Of course, if you have that kind of take that you don't even that you don't want to listen and talk to the others anymore, then I think then then all hope is gone, right? <clears throat> so the listening society requires that citizens in the Republican sense are ready to let themselves be touched by the others, even if they don't share their views. I mean, that's the point, right? And if you if you only let yourself be touched by those who already share your views and opinions, that's that's uh, that's not even politics, I would almost say, right? Of course, that does not mean that there are no conflicts of interest. There are antagonisms, antagonisms, and there are conflicts of value also, right? But the struggle does not necessarily be uh, antagonistic. And, you know, I think <coughs> there is a huge difference whether we fight about something like, I don't know, should we send weapons to the Ukraine or not? Is right now a fight in Germany, right? So, of course, we can struggle about this and we might have different interests and different values and we argue about it. But this does not pit us against each other. It's the third which is contested. We, we fight, we struggle about selling weapons or not. But it doesn't mean that, that I'm I'm the antagonist of the other person or of those who have a different opinion, right? It's about the ex that's what I call the external focus. The struggle should not be against the others, but it, but it, it should always be for uh, for certain substantive politics. Okay, now I, I really believe that's my third claim. I don't know what you think about this, but I really believe that it, at least implicitly, even if explicitly we don't believe in, you cannot define politics. You cannot distinguish politics from the mere pursuit of self-interest, right? And if you do not at least implicitly introduce a kind of conception of the common good, right? So if some neoliberals claim we need to lower taxes for the rich, they, they, cannot, they cannot defend that argument um, by claiming because, because the rich want to have more money, right? They have to defend this argument by claiming that that's good for everyone because it keeps the economy going. I mean, Liz Truss and her, her party, have, they have just done this, right? They really wanted to make the rich richer. But of course, they claimed that that would be good for even the poor in Great Britain. It would be good for everyone because it would get the growth engines going. So the idea of a common good, I would say, is, it, is necessary for, this, uh, for, the, for the conception of politics. Politics is the shaping of the common good, right, uh, of, of society, of the shared institutions. And this needs to include the sense of what is good for society and therefore good for the people. And if we now think of the common good as just an empty signifier, as Laclau and also Chantal Mouffe would do, right, and just as a strategic tool, we have to claim that we are pursuing the, 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 the common good, while in fact we are only kind of um, pursuing certain interests then democracy has already failed, I would really claim. I would almost insist of it. But now, and this is, so to speak, my last point, <clears throat> in which I want to, to, which directly leads to what I think of a listening society. Now, of course, what the, the substance or the contents of this common good is essentially contested, right? How, what the institutions should look like and what they, I don't know, the interest rate should be yet and so on, and whether landed property should be possible or not. So there will be struggles about, we will struggle about this. The, the, in substantive terms, you cannot define the good society in the sense of a good society is Christian or ecologist or whatever. This you cannot do. We cannot define the common good as in, in, a, in substantive essence, right? But we can define the relations we need for a good society, right? So I want to reintroduce the concept of the common good in relational term, right? The common good is realized when certain forms of relationship are realized. And that's the re resonance concepts, conception of democracy. So, but what is resonance? Quickly, right? Uh, resonance is a form of relationship. Since I'm talking about democracy, I won't now, uh, I, I will stay with this uh, basically, right? So, so, so you get in resonance with the world. It actually starts not with something you do, it's, I would really say resonance starts with the ear. 
And this is something Bruno Latour, who unfortunately just, uh, just died, has left us. He, he said so too, right? It's answering to a call. And you are in a mode of resonance when you let yourself be called by some other, you can do it with Levinas if you like, but it's not necessary, right? Something or someone is calling you. So resonance, the mode of resonance starts with a kind of, uh, with a passive re receptivity. Something is calling me. So, 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 so in a discussion, or, for example, right, you hear a voice, which you have not heard before. Maybe it was silenced before, right? You don't quite know what it says. And it says something which you don't really like, right? I actually believe resonance always in, in, um, um, contains an element of difference, even of friction. So, but the first element of resonance is something is calling me or someone is calling me. And the second element is you actually reach out to it. You want to connect to it, right? I want to hear you. You say something maybe which I find appalling, right? but democracy starts with a, with a sense that, yes, I want to hear and respond to that. And my response doesn't have to be a yes, but I'm ready to let myself be touched by this other, right? By this other voice and by this uh, uh, other meaning. And then I answer it. But of course, normally resonance is, you know, it, it's a disposition. And the second, so the first step is affection. Something affects me, it touches me, it moves me. It doesn't necessarily have to be a, a pleasant move, right? The second element, element is emotion moving outward, emo vere. I answer it. You see it when two people get in resonance. You see it in their whole body, in their eyes, right? They kind of get in a form of contact, which, which consists of listening and responding. And when this starts, we do not stay the same. When we get in resonance with each other, or as I claim, right, you can be in resonance with things or with nature, right, or with art. Uh, or, or with other people, right? Then there is always a transformation. Even in, in a, look, look, in a conference like you're having right now, there are two possibilities. One is that you find it boring. Maybe right now you're already kind of doing something on your cell phone or so, we all do or very often, right? Then it's not resonant, right? But when all of a sudden something catches your attention, right? And you open up to it and you answer it, then you are transformed in some sense. Then you will go home having somewhat changed your views, your ideas, or at least your emphasis. So resonance always has a transformative capacity. Right? And it is my, my, my conception of democracy says, citizens have to encounter each other as those who want to be in resonance. I want to hear you and I allow you to touch me even if I don't share your views. I mean, touch in a metaphorical sense. And it doesn't mean that I will simply follow your views. I will answer you on the basis of my strong convictions. And then let's see, let's move to a shared space. I, I know this is a bit optimistic, but I think it's the only way it can work. And the problem with this is that you cannot enforce resonance. We cannot force people to get in resonance, but at, even in a conference, we might try. You might go there with the best intention, but you just find it boring. It's boring what the German sociologist said, for example, right? Oh, it's so wrong that you are in a repulsive mode, right? I hate it, what I hear there. So this is the one problem. You cannot enforce or engineer resonance. The second problem is if we enter into resonance, like in a conference, like in the, in the discussion, no one knows what the result will be. I like Hannah Arendt's idea of natality, right? Out of the dialogue, the new ideas get born, but no one knows before what the new idea will be and where we will move. Right. So, so the new idea is not my idea or your idea or his idea or her idea. It's kind of, it's born in this interspace in, in, in that's natality in my conception, right? In the shared world. I think Hannah Arendt was very close to this too. So claim four, and this is the, 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 the final point I want to make, right? Um, the common good is really, what is the common good? It's a society or it's the realization in a form of life. You can call it a form of life. That's fine with me, right? Uh, which is kind of, which has created and preserved access of resonance in, uh, in, in five dimensions, you could say, right? So, so I really believe we need, I, I think if we want to change the world, we need to have some idea what it could look like. And I believe we cannot define this idea in substantive terms. We have to define it in relational terms. What kind of relationship would we have between citizens? But also what kind of relationships would we have in other spheres? I will briefly give to you and then I will stop because I 
Yeah, I, I think I actually have a, I have it, uh, I have an extended version of this, but I think I will leave it at the short version, right? So, so my idea is there should be access of resonance first of all between citizens, what I call a social resonance, right? So the idea there is that we encounter each other, as I said, as resonant beings, which requires that we do not just have voices, but also ears, and that we allow each other to transform our, ourselves. It's a Republican conception. You know, the, the good point about this is we do not need to share anything in advance. It's not that we need to share a religion or a language or a conviction or whatever, right? The, all we need to do is to, to encounter each other as citizens. I want to listen to you and I want to answer you in a transformative a sense, right? So the, the common ground is not kind of pre-required, pre but it's created in this form, right? And then my hope is that we create the institutions. I said, politics is about shaping the institutional world we live in, right? The, the structures of the world we live in. But if we create them in this form of social resonance in democracy, then there is resonance between citizens and the institutions, right? Between the laws and the, and the, and the parliaments and the governments and the, and the bureaucracies, right? Because, I mean, you know, it's an old Habermasian idea, of course. But he doesn't call it resonance, and 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 for me, his his theory is too much cent centered on cognition, right? And on even on reason, right? It's not that that we find the most reasonable thing, right? It's it's that we kind of resonate with this world because we have, because we have, we have participated in creating them. So my idea is here: there needs to be the common good means. There is resonance between the citizens and the structures they live in. And resonance does not mean agreement. And I really have many I could give you, or let's discuss it, many examples where you can see this work. Like, look, in a conference like you're having, I see you sit around tables, for example, and not in rows, right? So maybe maybe there was a discussion before, right? And so and some said, no, let's have rows. And others said, no, let's have this kind of table structure, right? And then you somehow reach the maybe majority decision that it, it should be this structure. But now even those who were advocating something else before can feel that they resonate with this structure because it was your decision to set up this in institution this way. So you would say, oh no, we have decided to, to, to use this structure, so let's do it, right? So the second is, the second axis of resonance is between citizens and the macro institutions uh, we, we live with and the structures. Then, of course, uh, the, the common good can be defined by the relationship between citizens and the natural and material surroundings, right? I, I th think this is very uh, important. It's not just, by the way, it's not just nature, so, so, so living in nature around us. It's also the built structure, the architecture, right? Being in resonance means listening and answering to the world around us. Of course, with, with respect to nature, it's very important. And there we do have a strong sense. Nature is not just the resources we, 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 we need to protect and we use up. Nature is, for, for, human, for modern human beings in particular, nature is this sphere of resonance. This is why people say, I have to go to the ocean. Only there I can feel myself, or to the mountains, or even to the desert, for example. Or the Germans go to the forest, right? Only when I'm in the forest, I, I live in the black forest. Right? <laughs> there, there I can hear myself. It gives you this access of being in resonance with nature. And of course, we can institutionalize this. I'm, I'm pretty sure right now we have institutionalized an aggressive mode towards nature. And I think we can institutionalize a mode of resonance with nature. It does not mean harmony. It does not mean that we always have to follow what nature, supposed nature, tells us. But we are in this mode, not in a mode of dominance and control and use, right? but in a mode of listening and answering. And what is most important, I believe we also need a kind of a sense of a historical resonance. This is very important. I think it's exactly what we have lost. We have lost, as, and this is part of the huge crisis we're in, we have lost the sense of a vibrant connection between past and future. You know, I mean, particularly in young people, we touched on it in, in the informal talk before, right? We have the feeling that we are alienated from the past. It's a colonial, imperialist, exploitative, racist past, right? So it's a kind of, we, we are now on the verge of kind of turning repulsive against our pa past. And we are almost, we are hopeless with respect to future. It will be bleak. It will be governed by climate disaster and maybe now by war and by other forms of plague, right? 
So, so I, I really think the common good is realized where societies are capable of creating a resonant connection between past and future. And, you know, speaking as a German, you're quite aware that this does not mean affirm the past or the problematic aspects of the past. It means listening and answering to historical experiences, right? E trying to make things better or to rectify or to restitute where it's possible, but also to say, oh, this, that was wrong. Let's, I mean, for Germany, you would say never again, the Holocaust, of course, or Auschwitz, right? But ne nevertheless, this might be a kind of existential call, I feel. I, I answer with everything I have and am to the not just to this aspect, but also to this aspect. And this kind of obliges me or it points me away of how I want the future to be. But apart from this political sense, I think it's very important that for people, you know, I mean, I would say all through modernities, modernity was really drawing its energetic force for the acceleration game, right? By the sense that parents said, we work as hard as we can, we struggle for our kids to have a better life. Right. This was an incredibly strong motivational idea that we kind of are connected to a resonant future. We create a better world for the next generation. So this, this gives you a kind of trans-historical sense where we come from and where we are going to. We are, we are part of an historical um, current running through us. And right now we are, we are in huge danger of losing it because now parents all over the world, in Japan as in South Korea or in the United States or Canada say, we have to work as hard as, as we can in order for our kids not to have a much worse life, right? Not to fall down the train, but we know through our struggling, we deteriorate the prospects of the future generations in the ecological realm. So we have completely lost this sense of resonance between past and future, and we need to regain it, right? Giving an answer to the past and finding a way forward to the future. And actually, when I come up, when I get to this point, I mean, you might have a lot of um, uh, objections to this already. I, I actually think, you know, I always, I, I think I'm quite good. I'm quite self-confident. I think I'm quite good at criticizing our, our, our dynamic stabilization society. But I always find it incredibly hard to come up with a positive outlook. So here I try, and I know you, it's, it, it, it has a lot of weaknesses still. But one, one potential weakness is that people say, well, if we create resonant forms of life like this, uh, can, couldn't they be totally non-resonant, instrumental, exploitative towards other societies, right? And, and we have this, of course, you could create a very resonant Canada, which lives on exploiting Bangladesh or, or parts of Africa or Latin America or so. And actually, I think, I think that that's a mistake. And I really think, you know, I mean, you could see it in Europe, but I know in the US at least you have, I, I, I think also in Canada, but let's take Europe. We have a lot of debates about migrants coming to, to Europe, right? And there are a lot of people say, oh, these migrants should stay away, right? And I always, I find this so telling, right? When you look at this, oh, they should stay away. Look at my face, look at my hand, my whole body and my voice. You really see it forces me to actually into a mode of aggression. Right, this kind of stance. I don't care about people in Bangladesh. They should care. They should look for themselves. If you say they say this, you really feel how you close yourself towards the uh, the outer world. Right, it's a disposition of closure. Right, resonance really means that you are that you let you let yourself be called and that you make yourself vulnerable. And therefore, I believe if we created if we created um, body politics which are resonant. They could not be non-resonant, non-listening, non-responsive towards other forms of lives, other forms of societies, those beyond the borders. They would need this element of responsivity, which is, involves the moment of care ethics in order to, be, to realize the common good along the other four axes at the inside. So I may, I, I'm sure I have not solved uh, the problems of the conference. It's just my feeble attempt. And I'm really looking forward to discussing this uh, with you a bit more. Thanks a lot for listening. Yeah, I don't know. I'll simply stop this. Uh, thank you so much for your thought-provoking uh, comments. Uh, we will see if there's questions or comments in the audience for Dr. Rosa.
Hello. I don't know if you can see, but it's quite a long way. It's like the walk of, do I have something pertinent to say? Um, thank you for your participation. In fact, I am just finishing an article that dealt with resonance, solidarity, and Anna Arendt. But as we discussed a little earlier this morning, academic life being what it is, it will probably only be published in a few years. And you've already quite responded to some of the question I was formulating, making it completely maybe useless. Um, my question is maybe like, is an invitation to go a little deeper in one aspect you discussed. It, it's about the conflict of interest and values, but the struggle mm. not being antagonistic, the focus being external. Mm. How, like, how, I don't, like, how can I say, the, the, it's really how that struggle being external, is it only because it's not directed to a person or to an identity and only on a discursive matter that it becomes more acceptable and not antagonistic? That's, I, I would really, if you could discuss a little more on, on that particular aspect. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's a good question because it's not so clear whether it works, but I do think, you know, man, if, for example, if you, even if you perceive of class struggle, right, I mean, you can perceive of it in two ways, of course, you could say, as a, as a proletarian, I mean, interestingly, I mean, all the academics I know always side with the proletarians, because it's the idea that you're on the good side, right, so you could just as well say, I, I as a good person, it's a bit like, I really think, you know, I'm, I really must say I'm concerned about this. I think in all the struggles I observe now, it's always like this. It's we, the good, fighting the bad persons, right? I mean, we as the proletarians fighting the bad bourgeois. And for example, I think even there it's wrong. I mean, it's completely wrong because someone who is born as a bourgeois is not by birth a bad person, right? Actually, he might be quite nice and be open to arguments. I mean, if, 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 if he give up that hope, I think then, then it's all is lost. And sometimes it seems to me as if people would say, since you are, a, I don't know, let's say you are a manager or so, you can only be a bad person. That's wrong, right? We can struggle about taxes or about whatever it is, but not as persons. And I think, you know, it, it has turned a bit like this. People who are against vaccination in Germany are treated against like, don't even talk to them. They are not rational beings. They are like animals. It's like, and, and then in war, of course, it gets even worse, right? So that's why I think, we might have really hard contests about whatever it is about 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 property in uh, in production or so, but, uh, but we should struggle about whether or not the, the company should be owned by the people or the house or whether land should be owned or not and not fight each other as persons. I, I believe conceptually it makes a difference and politically too. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions, Julie? Hello, thank you very much for your presentation. I would like to know, is common good possible in a capitalist society? No, <laughs> yeah. good question, yeah. I, I would say no, not really. I mean, not at least not in the, you know, I, I basically I would almost say no but by definition because of the capitalism, a capitalist society clearly is one that can only stabilize itself dynamically. It's the capital, capital accumulation process, right? Which is, the, the dominant motor in the logic of acceleration, innovation, and growth, right? So um, I would say it's not the only motor, right? We have this logic of dynamic stabilization, which, which prevents the common good from becoming a reality because it creates the mode of aggression. I think we have, for example, in the, in the political realm, as I just said, right? And there it doesn't necessarily require capitalism. And we even have it in the scientific world where the idea is that science is permanently about pushing borders and so on. So what I want to say in answer to your question, capitalism is not the only problem, but it is a huge problem. Now, the question is, you know, when you make this point in many contexts, you always get, I guess, not at your, at the, your conference, but in many, I try to talk to all segments of society. I really, tr I really try to, to be serious about my own claim. I, I do not, own, you know, look, look, I mean, something I find really, really important. 
you want to change the world, me too. We will not change it if we only talk to other leftists and activists, right? I mean, because we are a minority, we are losing out in the world. Let's finally be serious about this. I mean, you know, those who are, have a very different opinion, they are about to win. They just took over Italy and with Trump in the US and so on, right? And it's getting very hard. And if you only talk as leftists to other leftists, it's not of much use. So somehow we have to, uh, to enter in dialogue with us and um, uh, with other segments and, and people of a completely different view. And when you, when you tell them that you think capitalism is a huge problem, is a huge problem, then they always say, oh, you, do you want communism, right? Uh, but okay, that's not your, uh, I know that's not your question. But in reply to this, I say, I believe that markets do have some merits, right? I mean, markets are pretty efficient in, um, in doing the problem of uh, solving the problem of allocation, right? Supply and demand. And competition might be useful in some contexts when it comes to the question of who creates, a, I don't know, a vaccination or so. So I wouldn't say that necessarily there should be no market elements or no competitive elements in society. But I definitely think this, these forms of markets and um, competition should need, need to be politically and even culturally controlled, right? And kind of contained and re-embedded in the sense maybe of Polanyi. So my answer to your question is certainly not the current form, uh, uh, the common good along those four, five axes will not be realized in the current form of capitalism, right? There might be some capitalist elements which are compatible but I'm a bit skeptical about this, and, and those elements definitely have to be um, embedded and contained. Other questions? Hello, I live um, in Berlin, but I've been here gerade, but I'll speak in English. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you for this presentation, and I've read your work as well, and I've tried to read some in German and some in English and some in French, so it's interesting to get a bit of a different languages take on your work. You are talking about common good, and common good has often been a way to speak about the will of a majority, and common good hasn't always really been able to take into account the fact that um, so in a Canadian context, there are colonial relations inside the country. So whose common good um, would we talk about? Or which is not, you know, a German reality per se, but um, if we think about minority interests in other contexts, you know, you gave the example of this gender activist. And I'm thinking from a feminist and queer perspective that mm, common good has often meant actually subjecting myself to heteronormative mm. violence. So um, I, I wonder how you address this problem of common good from different perspectives and um, how that can actually just be a source of tremendous mm. violence. And I, in your call for us to listen to one another, um, I have really ambivalent feelings about that because I, on the one hand, think that you know, there's no way that we're going to move forward in certain ways without a certain ability, um, sort of a rhetorical listening and not just a speaking process. Um, and at the same time, I am wondering who has to do the listening and how come some people seem to be able to forgo that process of listening while others are constantly having to accommodate and think about how to speak and listen in the right way in order to be um, um, considered full human beings. And so yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm challenged, I'm sort of intrigued by y your appeals. And at the same time, I wonder if actually you're falling also into the kind of Habermas trap of let's all just sit down together and we'll work it out. Mm. Um, so I'd love to hear yeah. your thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. I, I think this is one. This is the kind of the hard, the hard case, right? Uh, in, in point, um, I think the problem with Habermas is really the, his idea is that we kind of sort it out by kind of, you know, giving the, you know, since everyone should have a say in the end, we will hear, hear the pure voice of reason, and that is very, <coughs> very different from what I have in mind. I don't want to filter out the pure voice of reason. 
I want to, I focus on the forms of relationship. And I think from the examples you gave and from your concerns, which I share, uh, but I actually, I, I, my feeling is that you actually made my points because you said uh, there is the problem of heteronormative violence, for example, and I would completely agree with you there, right? I mean, for example, in for, for the most time, the common good did not include the perspective and the voices of women. Women did not have a voice, right? I mean, that's exactly the reality, right? But what I really want to do is a critique of the conditions of resonance. And you could immediately see why such a society dominated by heteronormative uh, um, 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 structures, institutions, values, convictions, and practices, right? Is not, is, is not a kind of a resonance, is not a space of resonance between citizens because people who are, because women or, or people who are queer or gay or transgender or, or, or you know, all of the LGBTQIA plus, right? They did not have, they did not have a voice and a say. They were not included in this process. And the same is true for indigenous people. So I think this is exactly what I hope, what my, what my conception tries to aim at, right? As soon as you have a group of people who is kind of silenced, right, or who is whose whose voice is not kind of not not taken serious and so on, right? This is exactly why I want to criticize it. I think the problem with what you say, the common good has always been defined. I completely agree with that too. The common good has always been identified in certain groups' interests, but this is when you do it in substantive terms. And say, for example, well, the common good is realized when men marry women and are Catholic or so, right? That's a kind of substantive definition that actually closes the axis of resonance, right? It, this is a kind of definition which, by this definition, means you we, we no longer listen to, we are no longer resonant to everyone who is beyond this sphere, right? So when you define the, 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 um, the conception of the common good in relational terms, it requires that those who have been excluded, um, uh, exploited, uh, repressed so far, right, are kind of coming on equal terms, and of, and it requires it requires significant transformation on the side of the others. But the question how do is how do you get them to transform? Right? And and I, I mean I can only repeat myself. Look at the current world. I mean it's it, it almost looks like we are losing the struggle in this way. So I, so we need this kind of I believe. We need a kind of inspiring vision, which can become an inspiring vision for the majority of the people. Because if, it, if if we don't get it, all we will get is, if we cannot achieve this, all we will get is civil war, and that we might even lose. I mean, the world looks pretty grim right now. Hi there. So thank you so much for your talk. And um, I have a question for you, actually. Is it possible to say like you, if we agree with uh, the claim one, that the struggle or conflict is not the core of what should be democracy? Mm -hmm. And and then agree with you that with, uh, let's say, claim three and four, that we have to aim towards a listening society where mm -hmm. we could have several axes of resonances everywhere. But at the same time, since we don't actually share the same life wor uh, world, as you said in another article about the the, fr the fragmentation of the public space, we have several mm -hmm. ways of lives and modes of lives. And yeah. maybe can we have like a weak claim that could say that struggle is a part of politics. It's not like the core or the heart of politics. We should try to aim towards resonance, but sometimes mm -hmm. to go from where we are now, now like in capitalist growth society where the common good is not possible to reach towards a new society we have to fight in some way to reach some resonance yes. but in like in your book you say we cannot have a kind of struggle for the good life or for resonance but maybe we can have a kind of dialectic as some parts of the of the world of a uh, political action could be the struggle on one way against some specific things that destroy life. But yeah. at the same time, we don't have to lose like the, the ultimate goal of giving resonance as much mm -hmm. as we can. So can we combine both at the same yes. time? I'm not really sure. And I ask you the question. Yes, I think that's a good question. And I would say, yes, I, I, I think I, I agree with you too. And I have two answers. 
I would say on the one hand, there are, there are two forms of struggle, right? That, that's, that I always find very important for me. This was kind of eye-opening. Like, of course, I would say, of course, in one sense, struggle is an essentially an inevitable element of politics, but we can struggle about something in a very resonant mode. We have different opinions about how we should do it. That for, 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 I don't know. I mean, there are many, many uh, issues we talk about. Let's uh, talk about uh, sources of energy. Should we go for uh, hydrogen or should we go for um, uh, other forms of or so? And there can be heated debate. I mean, even down to where our identities are involved. I have this opinion and you have another opinion. And we struggle. It's like with a friend. My best friend, I always struggle with him, right? About We disagree about everything from politics to soccer, right? But it's it's a resonant struggle. I listen to your arguments and sometimes I'm moved and I think, oh, wait a second, you have a point there, but I still think you're wrong. You're totally wrong. I don't know why. So this is struggle, which is resonant. And I think this is politics. This is exactly politics. So it's struggling about how our world should look like, look how our world should look like, which doesn't mean that I want you to be dead or go away or silent or so, right? And then there is mo the, a struggle like this could actually have a turning point where I no longer want to listen to you. I just say, shut up, you're an idiot, go home, right? And you really see there is a, a change in the nature of the relationship, right? It goes from a resonant struggle to a repulsive struggle, right? I, I'm ready to, to beat you. That means I no longer want to be touched to, by you. I no longer want to listen to you. I want to silence you. And this is a problematic and ultimately a, a not good form of politics. But... And that's my second point. There, of course, might be, this is, I find this, I mean, I, I, I have, at first I didn't want to accept it, but now I would. There might be conditions where we need to go to repulsive struggles and even turn to weapons, like maybe in the Ukraine right now, right? And that, of course, is not resonant, but you have to, you might sometimes have to do it in order to preserve or create spaces of resonance, spaces of where political resonance becomes possible again, right? So I would agree that sometimes um, a str struggle in a repulsive sense might be a means to recreate spaces of resonance. But in the second sense, repulsive struggle could only be a kind of an, 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 an exception, a temporary uh, necessity. And, and when you have that repulsive struggle, you, the common good is not realized. Right? Thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Are you okay to stay for a few more questions? That's fine, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. I think you in part answered part of the question, but I, I was mm -hmm. wondering, you I, you mentioned um, several times the idea that listening is a disposition, and mm -hmm. I'm from the field of philosophy of education. So when I hear mm -hmm. that, I mean, a way to get people to listen would be to kind of teach the form that disposition for example in schools but we already mm. ask a lot from schools so i was wondering what how do you like in in your framework how how would you make people listen so you can form mm. that disposition i hear now that you said conflict is a way also to make mm. people listen but i yeah maybe you have other ideas yeah thanks for this question actually i mean you know education and the pedag ped pedagogy is really a huge I mean, this is one of the fields where I've really, uh, tr where I try to concentrate on. I've just, uh, I'm not, actually, I forgot, I think the, the book is not out in English yet, which is a pity because there's a number of books in German which are on the pedagogy of resonance. I really, I really am deadly convinced that uh, education, what in German we call Bildung, right? The process of, you cannot really translate this well into English, formation, right? Character formation, right? But in German, Bildung covers education, learning, and uh, and formation, and this 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 actually I, I mean this essentially is a process of resonance, right? Listening to something new, try feeling self-efficacy in answering. You, but by the way, I mean the second element of resonance is I sometimes use the term or not sometimes I I use the term self-efficacy for this. So this is important for politics, of course, too. People need to be affected, to let themselves be affected, which actually means, means, you know, you talk about the disposition and the disposition means that you make yourself vulnerable because it means you open up to, you let yourself be touched by something which you cannot completely control. So it's a, it's a risky process and it requires conditions of trust where you can allow this to happen. 
But, but building in this sense, education in this sense, is a process of resonance, being touched by new ideas, by new concepts, by new practices, trying to feel, to answer them by feeling self-efficacy and being transformed. Education in this sense of building always transforms the subject. So, and, and, there, and you can really see there are differences. In Germany, we talk about evidence-based conceptions of education. They actually lose all sense of resonance, right? For them, education is just transferring skills to people, right? And that, that, that creates, that's good for the mode of aggression, right? But I would really think, I would, I would say that education in a qualified sense is, on the one hand, it's a process of resonance itself, but on the second hand, it is really, it, it, it is really enabling the disposition towards resonance along the, actually, I just talked about this in, in another conference. What is the sense of what should schools do? I would really say trying to, to, to enable subjects to um, develop those axes of resonance in all spheres, on the one hand, towards other human beings, le lis listening and responding to those others, whoever they are, right? And it, whoever they are but also listening and responding to the material world and to the to the uh, what i call the existential sphere of nature or the universe or life itself and being in resonance with themselves this is very important i mean as i said in the beginning we are in a mode of aggression towards ourselves and particularly young people are being in resonance with themselves means listening and answering to your body to your psyche to your dreams to your memories and it doesn't just mean accepting them, but being in, an, in a process of uh, interaction. So I believe education really can be conducive to, should be conducive to creating this disposition of listening and responding. But we will not do it in schools which are geared for credit points and transferring skills. Any other questions? I might have one and then we can close since there's no one else. Um, to get back on the, uh, the idea of um, the listening society, and we talked about people who might not have a voice or who are absent from the discussion in a listening society. My question to you is those people who don't have a voice might be tired of listening to us. We're not listening to them. And how can we listen if they are not at the table or we don't want to hear them? So in this idea of resonance, how do we have a dialogue when they probably feel that they've listened to us quite a lot? Yeah. yeah yes, I, de definitely. But you know, I really, no, I mean, I'm, I'm really, I have strong conviction there. I mean, what you describe is kind of, I, I think in the way you ask, it's more focused on groups, which have been always kind of silenced, right? Or neglected or not seen and so on. But let's start with individuals. I think you, you, you have sometimes, you know, unfortunately, this society also creates individual positions, right? Where people have the feeling no one, you know, I always have to struggle. No one wants to, you know, solitude. People are, a lot of people are told terribly alone. There is a ministry of loneliness in Great Britain now, right? This is exactly the situation <coughs> where people feel no one wants to listen to me, right? Or no one listens to me. My voice is completely lost in the universe, right? So, so what, so I think there is this yearning that someone listens. And then you make the experience of self-efficacy. I can reach out. I have the capacity to reach out and connect and get this process of listening and responding started. And therefore, I think for groups which are neglected and which have not been listened to, right, the same process could work, right, that finally they realize, oh, now it's no longer kind of instrumental or paternalistic or whatever, or straightforwardly exploitative relationship. But if, 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 I mean, I consider myself to be in a privileged majority position, right? But I, but I hope that if finally we get ourselves into a real mode of listening, not this kind of paternalistic attitude of I will teach or we will graciously listen to you, but in a kind of, you know, the resonance is a human, it's a, it's a humble stance, right? That, that you really open up. And then I think, because, you know, this tiredness, probably will disappear because then those who have never been listened to 
will get the experience that they really that their voice will be heard. It, they will feel self-efficacy, and this will change the whole footing, the situation of those involved. And I think that's what we need, particularly the minorities, but the majorities need it also. I mean, they get this process started of really listening and responding. And it's not a utopian, you know, it's, I think it's not a utopian fancy because this mode of resonance, I believe, is the basic human form of being in the world and being to the world. If you, if you do child in infant studies, child psychology, you can really see that small children, infants, sucklings, right? When they, they try to get in contact with the world and the getting in contact with the world is not through language or through um, a reason. And it's not a possessive form. They don't start to want to have things. They want to get in resonance with them. And it's true that what doctors told me after I had written that, when we lose our capacity for reason and our capacity for, um, for language and our possessive, our property, we are still resonant beings, right? This sense of getting in resonance with other human beings, I believe, is the basic form of, you don't even have to learn it, you can dislearn it. And those who have never been listened to, they have kind of dislearned it. They are so deeply alienated for, for structural reasons that this process might be forgotten. But, but all we can do, and we have the, I think we have the duty and the obligation to get this process uh, going again. Well, thank you so much for spending your Friday evening with us. <laughs> it's pretty late in Germany. And uh, your thoughts, I'm sure, will get us thinking and talking for uh, many hours still. So thank you so much for being with us. Thanks a lot to you, too. I think you had a long conference, too, right? Okay, all the best. Bye-bye.